Welcome to Education, Leadership, and Beyond, Surviving and Thriving. My name is Andrew Murata, and this is show number 18. And uh, hopefully come Monday, Port Jervis will have the bell back in our schools. And that song was selected by our guest who's coming up in the next segment, Coach Matt Polanis, head football coach at Port Jervis High School. Today here on Education, Leadership, and Beyond, we are talking about teamwork and uh, things for your team and we're going to meet coach here in the next segment to talk all things Port Jervis football all things leadership and all things leading up to the famous Erie Bell game so we're excited uh, this morning here on education leadership and beyond Uh, a warm welcome to our uh, new listeners here on 96.7 in Pocono education leadership and beyond just got picked up in Pocono and I believe it's Sunday morning airing on uh, Pocono 96.7. So welcome to all of our listeners in that area. Again, my name is Andrew Murata, and I am the principal in Port Jervis High School in Port Jervis, New York. We've been doing the show several months now, and we're having a blast. We are also on Country 107.7 WDLC, 106.9 WYNY, and Wall Radio, all on the FM frequencies. 94.1, 94.9, 105.7, 106.9, 94.1, 94.9, 105.7, all on the FM, 1340 AM, 101.5 HD2. And again, a warm welcome to 96.7 FM on the Pocono. Before we get started with our opening concept, I did uh, certainly want to take a pause. Uh, that thing in Las Vegas, that terrible tragedy, a terrible shooting Uh, It really, to quote Jason Aldean, you know, hurt my heart. Uh, Something just terrible. As a high school principal, you know, you hear a lot about school shootings and that violence. And, man, uh, I was so devastated to to watch that and and, and witness that. And uh, being a school leader, again, we're going to have our leader of the football team on next. But being a school leader, you know, dealing with mental illness and dealing with issues in young people, although this is not a young person. He's uh, 64 years old, this guy that did the shooting. But that's something that we, w- you know, we certainly look at. And uh, But my heart goes out to those victims and their families. Uh, as you know, if you've been listening to the show, I love country music. And uh, to be at that festival and to have that, that terrible shooting happen, it was just awful. So our heart goes out to Las Vegas and uh, those victims. And uh, let's all make this world a better place. That's how we end the show each week. And uh, I think that's all of our roles, and uh, I think that uh, just additional kindness and compassion and love towards one another goes a long way. So that being said, let's get started. Uh, We are going to talk about teams and teamwork uh, as today's opening concept. Uh, As our guest today is Coach Matt Polanis. We're going to discuss his team in a little bit. I got my buddy and, and my producer here, Gavin Burt, is here. Gavin, were you uh, on some teams when you were in high school? Do you have experience on being on a team? Sort of. I didn't actually play, but I videotaped the games and uh, was manager in the third year, my senior year, for our hockey team. And that was about 20 years ago, so I'm really r- racking my brain to remember what that was like. But as manager, there was another manager. We would have to sound the buzzer or put the scores up on the scoreboard, et cetera, et cetera. And we didn't interact with the team that much. Obviously, we interacted with them on the bus, but it wasn't like we, you know, I saw them in the locker room or out on the the ice. But uh, I think it's still important to have a manager or someone who's videotaping the games. Were they inclusive to you, Gavin? Did they make you feel part of the team or did they kind of shut you out because you weren't putting the jersey on? It depends. It's funny. It could go either way. There there were times they would be inclusive and other times they weren't as inclusive. Really? But, you know, I think sometimes with young men, you know, look, I was immature once upon a time. I'm still immature in some ways. I think with young men, sometimes they don't always have the best of social graces. And that's not an insult. It's just a fact of life, you know. And we're going to get into that because uh, Coach Polanis uh, directs all things football on the field, but also has to deal with a lot of things off the field. And we're going to we're going to talk about that. Uh, in a minute. But Gavin, I know you're an important part of the team here at WDLC and certainly an, uh, the important part of education, leadership and beyond. So I appreciate you uh, uh, being here with me and 
making me sound so good on the radio. Thank you. And if I can give any advice to anyone who's young, who was in my shoes 20 years ago, life does get better. And when you get older, you get a lot more respect in life. It's not uh, like on that hockey team where it was, it varied from day to day. It sounds like a country song, Gavin. Maybe we'll write some lyrics to it. There that. you go. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's get to it. I adapted uh, this concept from my good friend Dan Spanauer down in North Carolina. He's the head basketball coach at West Stokes High School. He's also the owner and CEO of the Leadership Publishing Team. And Dan had an article on there that was adapted from terrystarbucker.com about things your team must do. I, I refer to my staff at Port Jervis High School a lot of times as my team. I have my family team. Uh, I, there's a lot of teams I'm on, my referee teams, and uh, these are things that I, I thought would resonate and uh, make a good uh, talking point for today's show, especially with our guest coming on, Coach Polanis. Uh, so number one uh, in the leadership publishing uh, journal, again from my Dan Spanner, so his advice, they must think. I always say at school and, and uh, at work, put a lot of smart people in a room and challenge them to come up with the answer. So you want to empower your team to think. Number two, they must see as the leader, as a part of the team, whatever your role is, you want to have transparent things. You want to make things clear. You want to have a clear schedule. You want to have a clear uh, goal. So you want your team to see. Number three, they must act. Again, we're going to meet Coach Polanis coming up here and uh, you know, he calls to action for his players. And uh, I, I think of that line in one of my favorite movies called The Hoosiers uh, with Gene Hackman many years ago. Uh, he's in the huddle. They're down one point, and uh, he's going to run this play, and the players did not like it. And if you watch that famous movie, Jimmy Chipwood, the best player on the team, says, Coach, I'll make it. And Coach changes the play and runs it for Jimmy Chipwood, and I won't give the ending away. Everyone knows what happens. Of course, Jimmy hit the shot. But Coach, you know, put the action into place. Jimmy put the action into place, and they trusted one another. That leads us into uh, point number four. They must interact. You want to set that team up. You want to get your team going where they're interacting with one another. They're interacting with the coaches. It's not a lecture uh, coach doesn't sit there and lecture for two hours at practice. He's got those guys interacting, moving, uh, and grooving together. So um, fostering a tight-knit group, you want them to interact. Number five, they must talk. Communication is one of the most important things in the dynamics of a team. They must talk. Uh, when I have meetings, I like to make sure I go around and make sure everyone has a, a, an opportunity to talk. And uh, as, a, as a team, you need them to communicate. You think about uh, football, those guys, there's always hooting and hollering and yelling. Uh, there's arm signals, hand signals. Guys are always communicating uh, together. Number six, they must fail. I know uh, our team lost a, a tough game a, a couple of weeks ago, and you hear a lot of teams uh, or coaches say in terms of college basketball, it's probably good that they leave, lose early. They don't want to be going late in the year without a loss. People learn from from failure. Um, uh, one quick story: when I was a, a first couple of years as principal, uh, our teachers were doing a great job, and uh, uh, I had uh, I addressed teachers not putting their parking passes in the mirrors at a faculty meeting. And I had a veteran teacher stand up and say, Mr. Murata, we are busting our butts. We are grading papers. We're doing all these things for this kid. And you're going to comment to the whole staff about two or three people that aren't putting their parking passes hanging from the rearview mirror. You know, I find that disrespectful. And I, and I, I said, you know what? She's right. She was right, that teacher. And that was a mistake on my end and a failure on my end. And I wanted to make good on that. So you got to have your team members fail. Lastly, you must let them lead. Coach Polanis has fantastic leaders on his team. There is captains and uh, you want to empower your leaders. One of my mentors always told us, uh, John Clockerty, he'll be coming on the show here. He's a, a former head of the ACC officials and uh, a 12-time Final Four referee, John Clockerty. He always told us, never miss a chance to let them see you shine. 
and and he put us in leadership positions and uh, that was something he said and um, so to recap things that your team must do they must think they must see they must act they must interact they must talk they must fail and they must lead these were adapted from the leadership publishing team uh, out of Winston-Salem, North Carolina, Dan Spanauer. Great stuff. I want to tell another quick story. Proud to have Coach Polanis coming on next. Buzz Aldrin was one of the uh, the second person on the moon on that uh, famous flight 1969 uh, where we had our first man on the moon, but Buzz Aldrin was one of the three astronauts. Buzz Aldrin was from Montclair State, New Jersey. And in uh, when they did go up to space and they did land on the moon, uh, they were allowed three VIP passes uh, in NASA. And they were, um, you know, the, the astronauts' closest family and friends uh, able to, to view in a special area. And Buzz Aldrin in 1969, he selected three people. His mother, his father, and his from Montclair State High or Montclair uh, High School, his football coach, Clary Anderson, and we're going to talk with Coach Polanis about significance and the impact that he has on young people's lives uh, coming up in our next segment. But how about that? That that the first trip where men stepped on the moon, Buzz Aldrin, 1969, he invited his high school football coach because of the great impact that Coach Cleary Anderson had on his life. Uh, and I found that to be an amazing story. And I know uh, Coach Polanis is doing great things for our kids in Port Jervis and, and, and beyond. So we're going to meet Coach up in our next segment. This is Education, Leadership, and Beyond, Surviving and Thriving. This is Education, Leadership, and Beyond, Surviving and Thriving. My name is Andrew Murata, and this is show number 18. Normally, I like to sing along. We seem to have a lot of sing-along songs. Certainly, Coach, I don't know if I'll be singing along to uh, Enter Sandman, but I am getting pumped up for the game. Well, and, that's a uh, little kick to Mariano Rivera. You know, the Yankees play tonight, so. You're rooting for the Yankees. Well, we're going to be rooting for the Red and Black this Saturday, and I know uh, you are. That was Coach Matt Polanis. Coach, uh, thank you so much on a busy week for coming in. Uh, to talk football and leadership. Welcome to the show. Nah, thanks for having us, Andrew. Appreciate it. It's always fun to talk football and leadership. Matt, uh, you are the head football coach at Port Jervis High School, and you've been so for several years now. What's the best thing about that, Coach? And then the second question is, what's the most challenging thing about that? Well, I'll tell you, Andrew, you know, as a, as you didn't know me as a young kid, but as a young kid and playing Port Jervis football and playing all athletics here at at, at in Port Jervis, uh, I was awful competitive. Uh, my wife often tells me that I'm too competitive. Um, when I moved moved away, went to college, and and on down to Florida, to start my uh, teaching and coaching career down there, uh, I lost a lot of that competitiveness. Um, my first job back when I came back to New York in Port Jervis and coaching JV football, uh, I remember we we won when I was first on the sideline. We won uh, on a last second play and I remember jumping up and down and screaming at the 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 people from the other sidelines and uh and I was like wow where'd that come from and you sit back and you look at it, it's like you know there's somebody my age on the other side that's trying to stop what I'm teaching my kids to do so one of the best things about being the being football coach and, and now head football coach is is that competitiveness is, is never leaves you and I get excited uh every game I get excited prepping for uh prepping for the week practice uh, you know that that competitiveness those juices you know have come back and uh it's pretty exciting and and the most challenging coach well i'll tell you you know we deal with so many personalities you know on the field off the field in the stands in the in the public eye uh some of that stuff does drag on it does get tough with it, you know every day um we often say boy i just want to coach football but you know, in our in our spot as coaching staff, we have to deal with a lot of different things, and we're dealing with people from different backgrounds, and we're trying to help our kids become better adults. Become, you know, we're talking about this this show here. We talk about leaders, um, become better people, and you know that stuff is is challenging because uh, everybody learns at a different style, 
and sometimes a coach's style might be a little bit harsh for other people. So we're trying to figure out different ways to handle that stuff and, and deal with um, you know the negative criticisms that we're bound to get. I know I knew what I signed up for when I became the head coach that some of the stuff was going to be negative, um, and it's not so easy all the time. Comes with the job, coach. What? What did bring you back? I mean, your your tradition here in Port Jervis. I'm only here 13 years, but uh, I know your roots run real deep. You know what brought you back home? Well, it's kind of well, definitely my wife. Um, I came home from the summer. I was teaching down in New Smyrna Beach High School in Florida near Daytona, and uh, I came home for a couple weeks. Um, I ran into my wife Erica at at a red light. She wasn't your wife at the time. Not, Not at the yet. time. Not at the time. <laughs> okay. um, she ended up calling the house, said, hey, Matt, I'm I'm working over here. Why don't you come and, and hang out? And, you know, I went over there, and uh, we started talking. And, and from there, it was just like that was it. We stayed. I st- actually stayed an extra week and a half uh, without going back down to Florida. And um, we did a year apart. We grew close, and we decided at the end of that year we were going to – one of us was going to move somewhere. At that end of that year, um, Erica got a – job offer at the Center for Discovery, uh, and actually at that time, my father was sick at the time, so it was made a real easy decision for me to come home and, and be close to family. It would have been tough for her to move down there without any family. It was simple for me. to I have plenty of friends and family here, so uh, it was pretty easy and probably the best decision I ever made. And was football in the back of your mind at that point saying, hmm, you know, my dad, I could, I could, get, I could get back into that? Well, I tell you, football, not so much at that time, you know, just 15 years ago now, 16 years ago, something like that. Uh, I was a big baseball fan. I was always loved baseball, and I felt that was where I could really help out the coaching staff. At the time, Mr. Corvino was here. He wasn't leaving anytime soon. Um, he didn't have any openings for coaches, so I, I concentrated on baseball. And then when he retired and, and football um, stepped into my my sights, it became – a passion now, uh, and, and again, I, I couldn't be happier. Coach, your your father uh, left such a great imprint on Port Jervis and his history there. What's it like, you know, walking behind your father and, and being in? A, I'll say I don't want to say similar, uh, exactly the same role, but you know. Well, yeah. <laughs> looking back, we're, we're basically exactly the same role. Yeah. Dad started. Dad started coaching, and he was teaching PE at the middle school. Um, he ended up being a freshman football coach under Coach Viglione for years. And then there was a time that when Mr. Viglione left, if he was going to go try to be the head football coach or become the athletic director, he looked at it for a family issue, you know, might be a little smarter to go to the athletic director spot. So I asked him a couple years ago when I got the job as a head football coach, I asked my dad, I said, did you ever regret not doing that? He goes, oh, yeah, I would have loved to do that. You know, it's still still in my heart, you know. So it's nice. Uh, he lives with us. I go home. Um, there's some of the ideas I bounce off him and get his old-time viewpoints. Uh, some of the things that he would – how he would handle it, I don't think I can handle it that same way anymore. Um, but, you know, it's kind of interesting to, to see that we, we both kind of did the same things in our career and our lives. And, uh, you know, it, it's nice to have him here to help out. And those are, I'm sure, a lot of uh, advice, a lot of guidance from your dad. But it is a different era now, Coach. Um, you know, even putting your your arm around a player, you know, someone could say he's he's grabbing him around the neck. You know, uh, it's a, it's a different day and age. What's that like, Coach? Working in an era where you're in such a a spotlight, everything's on tape, everything's on film, uh, and and really, I mean, you're under such scrutiny almost more than the high school principal. What's that like working in, in 2017 as a head football coach in a small town? Yeah, I'll tell you, it's it's not easy. You know, it's not easy, especially being raised by my father and, and the way I was raised. It's, you know, he was stern hand. He never, uh, the consequences were there, were quick. You know, we knew if we did something wrong, we, we didn't want to disappoint him um, because he was he was going to be pretty upset. And, and the fear that he put in our in our hearts more was not I don't make mean to say that it was a fear you were afraid of him but you didn't you respected him so much you did not want to disappoint him um and you if you ever talk to any of his former players that's the exact thought that they have 
Um, I'll talk to some of the former players, and he'll say, boy, even now he's 85 years old. I, st- I-, I step up and I say, hi, Mr. Planis, and my knees shake uh, just because he commanded that respect. Um, the way he could handle that different ways, uh, I- I- it can't happen this that way anymore. Um, the old Woody Hayes, uh, Bobby Knight, stuff like that, it just doesn't. It, it, you'll you'll be in in the lawsuit faster you, than you'll be on the you'll be on the back page pretty quick. Yeah, 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 you'll be on the front page instead of the back page. And that's something that you and I talk about off air and and for many years now. You know the headline test. Um, there's a magnifying glass not only in Port Jervis uh, but any any really small town. Uh, I joke that it's the high school principal, the head football coach, and the drama club coordinator during the time of the musical that that get the most scrutiny. Uh, Matt, in the opening segment, I told that story about Buzz Aldrin bringing his high school coach and what an impact that that high school coach had on Buzz, that he brought him to that viewing area, only could bring three people. How do you take that role and responsibility of being such a significant member in these young men's lives? Well, it's one of the reasons why we became teachers. You know, we had a, we have that opportunity to affect people. Um Way, the way I look at it is, you know, in our town, in, in the town I taught in before, uh, you know, not everybody was fortunate enough to have the family that I had, the, the, the grassroots. And I saw something from Urban Meyer years ago when he was coaching down at Florida that what he would do uh, is he would always have a day where he would bring his family around uh, and all the coaches would bring their families around. And the point was that, you know, some of these some of these kids that we – deal with don't realize what a family is they don't have all the, those pieces in place and I took that as as a pretty a pretty strong statement um, basically because I, I got to understand where everybody comes from and, it, and it's not easy on my part but I always try to try to lead by example and I try to be able to show those guys uh, you know that it's okay to you know, hey, we got to take off. I got to go take off. My daughter's playing volleyball today, you know, or my or my, my wife needs me. I got to leave, you know, and, and understand that that family is really important. So I try to lead in, in that way, um, and I take the, the 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 onus of being a positive role model for those guys uh, by example. And that's, a, you know, it's so nice. I, your kids are around. I see them at practice. I see them after school. Uh, around and it is nice to have uh, your your family there. Matt, we talked about your father a little earlier. You know, the name of the show is Education, Leadership, and Beyond. Who is a leader that that you look up to, whether it's in the role of football or in leadership in general? Who is someone that you admire uh, or is even a mentor in your life? Well, you know, I uh, (laughs) family's big. So um, my mother, uh, Betty Jane, she's a member of our Hall of Fame. Um, she, uh, passed away when I was 16, but the stories that I hear, you know, I was fortunate enough to be around for 16 years and know what she did. Um, so I, I draw a lot back onto what, how she led her life and what she did. Um, my uncle was the mayor here. So yes, we do have a lot of roots in Port Jervis. My uncle was the mayor here for a long time. Uh, her, her, her brother Art and my mother was a lot of behind the scenes stuff. She led by example. She did a lot of other things that people wouldn't want to do. And she organized things. She didn't want the credit. As long as the kids enjoyed, people were safe, uh, she was she was um, happy. And so I always look back to that. You know, people, you know, today, um, I do look at a lot of the coaches. I, you know, I've been ever since starting to coach, I look at Lou Holtz. I look at how he, uh, some of the some of the books that he wrote. Um, Urban Meyer is, is, has done a lot, a lot of nice things. Uh, you know, there's, there's, there's people out there that you just kind of take bits and pieces from everywhere. Um, lucky enough where I'm at in this town in Port Jervis, uh, I do know a lot of people. Um, it's nice to get some advice from people that have been there before. Mr. Semerano, who just recently retired and Mr. Corvino stay around. They're only, they're a phone call away to say, Hey, how would you do this? How would you handle that? And honestly, I work with Mr. Ray Hollick and, uh, you know, the legend. He, he is a legend, and he's he's a lot of fun. But uh, I, I love having him around to bounce ideas off of him because um, he's 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 been around a long time, so he's he's seen a lot. 
great men you just mentioned, and I look forward to having some of these gentlemen on the show moving forward. We do have to take a break. My name is Andrew Murata, and this is show number 18, and uh, happy and proud to have my friend and head football coach on today, Coach Matt Polanis. Coach, the team is 4-1. Uh, the, 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 the air is good. The, the feelings are good. Um, but there's two hot topics that no matter if the team was 1-4 and four or 4-1, four and one, it would still be on our doorstep. One is this, these national protests we're seeing uh, from the NFL down uh, with kids taking uh, a knee or the players taking a knee during the national anthem. And the second is concussions. So let's start with the first one. Um, our team has literally been in line uh, due to a lot of the work that you've done and your staff. Talk to me about your discussions with our players about this topic and, and what's been your approach. Well, we started out with just a couple individuals that we brought in, some some key individuals that, that, that are into the issue. And uh, we just talked to them. I told them my views, you know, where I felt um, what was right or wrong. And then, but also to let them understand that I I understand where they're coming from. Um, So we started with, with uh, individual discussions and then it led to some more team discussions. This past week we had um, the players wanted to have an all, uh, all team meeting, all players meeting without any coaches in there. So uh, to discuss their thoughts on the national anthem and, and the protest and possible possible things are going on and you know what I, I I was nervous I was uh, skeptical of what was going to happen um, but as we got going we you know we definitely understood as as a team that you know that the, we we felt as our group and our coaches um, that the national anthem wasn't a spot to protest it was a spot to show unity a spot to show um, respect uh, you know, and and it, the coaches and the players they all they agreed. Uh, our coach, our players met, and I I told them to to go ahead and do it. You know, I said, but here's the deal. We were talking about this for two or three days, a uh, pretty hot topic, and I talked to ten or twelve people, and everyone had a different viewpoint about it. Um, and you know, I have my views based on my family, based on my recent history, my past history um, with our families, and, and I have my own views. Uh, you may have your own views. Someone else might have their own views. Uh, and in all, they're really not all wrong. Um, so my point was to have those kids have a good, healthy conversation. So I understand where you're coming from. I understand where that guy's coming from, and I understand what that guy's coming from. And I do think, really, that's part of what, this protest is about is you know getting that communication going so you understand where other people's feelings are other people's thoughts are and the kids started out a little rough conversation but once they kind of settled in um they they talked about their views they talked about why they felt so strongly one way or the other and i thought it was pretty healthy that those guys understood each other a little bit more um so i think that's probably one of the main things that this this protest stuff is it should should happen and matt we talked in the opening segment about things that you you should do for your team or allow your team to do and just in that act of letting the kids talk amongst themselves and and you sharing conversations you you ticked i circled four out of the seven you, you they must act they must interact they must talk and they must lead, and you you allowed for that to happen under your watch. And uh, the boys did go out and do the right thing, and 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 they showed respect for their families, uh, themselves, our country, and um, I, you know I was proud of the way you and the team handled that. Um, you know, again, you mentioned a lot of your own personal beliefs, and you know I believe people should stand and pay pay respect. Uh, but for our listeners, you know, there are kids that, that don't stand in the morning. When we say the pledge mm-hmm. every morning and they don't stand, and the law states we can't make them. Yeah. People want us to drag them out and, you know, throw them in the river. Like, you can't. And that, that's what the law states. I went to the uh, Army football game, the most patriotic place there this, this Saturday. And since we've been going through this past couple of weeks, it's, you know, it was, it was kind of interesting to, to look back up in the stands uh, of what people were doing, you know, 
I would say everybody was standing that I saw, but, uh, you know, did everybody have their hand on their heart? No, they were standing at attention. They were respecting the flag and everything. Um, so it, it was interesting to see, you know, especially in that spot, uh, what people were going to do. And, and you, you heard rumblings. I, was, I wasn't at my seat yet, so we stopped when the national anthem played. And you hear people saying in the background, I wonder if anyone's going to take a knee on, at this place. Mm. And, you know, no one did that I saw. Um, and it was a pretty great spectacle to watch over there if you've never been. Sure. Sure, and Matt, like you said, you know, let's get let's get to the football. Those kids, we want them doing the right thing, but we want you, uh, you know, getting to the football. Well, that was the bottom line I had with our guys. I said, you're 16, 17 year old kids. Um, you know, you should be worrying about having fun, playing football. You know, your girlfriend, where you're going out to dinner later on. You know, the fun stuff. I said, this is the fun times. That's what you want. You want to look back on your career at at Port Jervis High School and saying. Boy, we played for the championship title, or boy, should have, or would it be should have, could have, woulda, you know? Um, do you want to look at it in a negative, or do you want to look at it a positive? And I wanted them to all look at it a positive, and that's that's where they that's where they went with it. Matt, the second topic that's affecting uh, uh, the, uh, not only our team but teams across the country, it's a hot button topic, different than in your dad's day and age. Uh, concussions. Tell uh, tell me, tell our listeners, you know, a kid gets his bell rung out there. What's different now? What has to happen, and, and what do you need to be aware of as the head coach? Well, boy, I, I mean, I started as a trainer. I went to college to be a trainer, and that's where I was doing down in, in East Carolina or in Florida uh, for seven years. And I was, I had the ability to look at a kid, go through his the the physical tests. You know, is he uh, is he dizzy? Does does he have good balance? Is he slurring his words? Um, does he remember what happened? Uh, anything nauseous or anything and I, I could go through all those tests and then I could clear him that day to let him get out there and play uh since that time I mean wow it's you know if a kid comes off and says a few buzzwords um you know coach I took a hit and my head hurts coach uh, I felt a little dizzy I don't feel right uh those are some checklists that that we have now is in a legal sense that coaches have to do we have to if if they th- throw a few bu- buzzwords out we take them out immediately we have to go through our protocol, and then they're out. They're out of that game until they're seen by a doctor, and not uh, just a doctor. They ha- a, neurologist a neurologist has to sign off. Yeah, yeah. So it it is different, you know. Uh, and it, you know, we, we've had our battles with it with with some things. Um, some people just got hit and they were fine, but there's also those kids that get hit and then all of a sudden it doesn't hurt that day it starts hurting later on that's the that's the tricky thing about the concussions uh, it can come the symptoms can come back later on and we tell the kids every every year said look I know you want to play I know you're dying to play but your life is more important than playing in this game my first year as a head coach we played at uh we had the Thanksgiving Day game and my my captain got hurt on the second or third play and he was out. He was dizzy. He was. He didn't know what was going on. But he kept on asking me, Coach, I want to go back and play. Coach, I want to go back and play. And, and tears are in our eyes saying, you know, son, you can't. This is his last football game ever. Mm. And, Matt, we uh, those kids are going to want to be on the field this Saturday. Uh, we're pre-recording this uh, the week before the big bell game. Matt, uh, you know, leading up to the game, how do you feel, and, and what are you looking forward to most uh, for the game? Well, feeling pretty good. I, I, if we we taped this last week, you know, we might have a different answer. Uh, you know, we, we ran into a little little hiccup against Goshen. They they came out and really put it to us, and we didn't play well. We weren't ready, and uh, it was it was not not a fun fun Saturday last weekend. Um, then we got a short week, came back to Walk Hill, and really put something together. I know Walk Hill's on a down year, but our guys really were sharp on Thursday night. Uh so feeling pretty good about about the Middletown game. It's 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 one of those games that uh it doesn't matter what your record is. You can be 5 and 0 or 0 and 5 and all those records go out the window when you're playing Port Middletown. Uh it's a great healthy ri- rivalry. Uh it's been going on for a long long time. 100 and, I think it's the 139th game. There's Yankees, Red Sox, Celtics, Lakers, Port Middletown. That's what I like to say. <laughs> I can't wait. Matt your role, you're directing everything. How do you keep your players grounded 
for this game because they're young men, their emotions, their hormones. You you need him to get focused for the game. How do you do that? I rely on my assistant coaches <laughs> a lot. I'll tell you though, it is it's not easy. It's you know you're playing mind games every day, uh, trying to keep them where they should be. Uh, we have a lot of stuff going on for homecoming week and and bell game week, and we have we have we're part of this national rivalry series that's coming into town. Um, we're giving awards out before the game, you know, so it's awful exciting for the kids, and, and that's part of it too. You know, this is high school football. That that's at its truest sense. This week is high school football. Uh, both towns are excited. They can't wait. There's a build up all week long, and then bang, we're there on Saturday, and supposedly, hopefully, going to be another beautiful Saturday afternoon um, with the kids. We just try to, you know, let them know, you know, right away. This is what's going to happen. You're going to have three to four thousand fans there. No one else in this state will play in front of three to four thousand people. And they look at you, and they're a little, little wide-eyed, and we're like, yeah, that's the way it's going to be. Um, it's going to be fun. It's going to be loud. Uh, and, and we try to be right at right forthright with them. And keeping them grounded is, is tough, but that's part of our job. We just do a lot of different little things with them and, and kind of knock them down a little bit and then build them back up Thursday and Friday, and hopefully they explode on Saturday. And uh, we're looking forward to that, Matt. And uh, I've already cleared some space in the hallway. We've got our truck ready, so no extra pressure. Uh, Make sure you get the paint. We'd like to see that bell back in the uh, in our hallways. Matt, we're going to be up against the commercial break. I got some rapid-fire questions. These are quick answers, Coach. This is a little curveball uh, I got for you. Quick answers. I got the head football coach here, uh, family man, Matt Polanis. Let's go. The last book you read? Above the Line. Last movie you saw? Uh, it had to be an Avengers movie with my son. <laughs> <laughs> it's good stuff. The coach you would most want to coach alongside, pro or college? I think Steve Spurrier. If, if a college program called you and said, we want you to be part of that staff, which college would you want that to be? Oh, Penn State. Penn State. Uh Ten is the worst thing you've ever seen in your life. One is it, it was it was great. How bad was Deflate Gate in your mind? Oh, it was awful. It was it, that's a nine. Nine out of ten. How about the videoing, the, the the filming of the other guys' offense or whatever they would do in the Patriots? Oh, the, 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 that's high too. That's got to be seven, eight. I mean, that's just that's just plain out cheating. Where do you want to be in five years? Uh, hopefully, right here with about five more Bell championships and five more section titles. And and what are you hoping for this Saturday here? In just a couple hours, the show is on on Saturday morning. Just a couple hours you'll be on the field. What do you what do you want to see? Uh, we want to see a good win. We want to have a big crowd out there, and we want to see uh, the red and black proving everybody proud. That's Coach Matt Polanis, everyone. We'll be right back. This is Education, Leadership, and Beyond, Surviving and Thriving. My name is Andrew Murata, and this is show number 18. And thank you so much for tuning in uh, this morning. I hope you enjoyed the program. We're on WDLC, WYNY, Wall Radio, and now 96.7, Pocono 96.7. Gavin corrected me there. Uh, A quick recap of our opening segment. We talked about things that you must do for your team or allow for your team. They must think. They must see. They must act, they must interact, they must talk, they must fail, and they must lead. And I got this from my good friend. Uh, he publishes the leadership publishing, uh, the leadership publishing team, Dan Spanauer, down in West Oaks, North Carolina. This last portion of the show uh, is a write-in portion. Uh, you can email in andrew at neversinkmediagroup.com, or you can hit me up on Twitter at Andrew Murata 21 and certainly check out my website, andrewmurata.com. But before we get to our writing question, my man Gavin has a question for Coach Polanis. Yes, I was recently reading in the Wall Street Journal about how football in some parts of the country, say Alabama, is high school football, is just as active as ever, but in a state like Vermont, they're literally combining teams due to fewer players. Now, some of that is just because people are moving away from the Northeast. From what you see in Port Jervis, as well as anywhere else in the state, Hudson Valley, beyond, 
or what you hear, do you see high school football participation going down, and are there factors other than population loss causing that? Well, looking around uh, just to Section 9, speaking just to Section 9, uh, we look around and you see a lot of the dwindling teams. Uh, we look, constantly look over. We're, we're in A school, and to look across the field and see 25, 22, on any, any underneath 30 uh, is a big surprise. I mean, I know when we were, when we were in our heyday in the 80s, uh, 70s and 80s, I mean, we would have 50, 60 people on our team, on the vars- dressed on our varsity team. Um, right now we have we have 41. Uh, we are actually probably the biggest A school as far as I, I haven't seen Cornwall yet, but of all the schools that we've played in the A schools, we are the biggest team out there. Um, so I do think some of the some of the stuff is the availability of different sports. Um, the the X game stuff is definitely has taken athletes away. Uh, but definitely now that the hot hot topic has been for the past I don't know five six years has been the concussions and the the studies that are out there are not complete they're not out there to to really say you know if you start at seven or you start at eight or you start at twelve or start at fifteen um, they're so concussions are so unpredictable too it can happen uh, just just falling on the ground your head shakes a little too too much and you get a you get a concussion so um, people are very afraid they're very afraid for their children and uh, it's led to a lot of different a lot of different rules in football um, we have a, a, a new new system out there called heads up football uh, sponsored by the NFL that we got to go out there and we've got to teach our kids how to tackle differently to keep them more safe Thanks, Gavin. Thanks for that question. Thank you. Matt, we did get a question sent in to us um, from a, a local a person here in town. They have young children, and they write, Coach, what would you recommend uh, would, would be best for getting my children starting out in football um, you, you know, the, with the concussions? What's the right age? And uh, you know, if you're going to allow your children to play, in your opinion, Coach, you know, when, should, when should they start playing? Well, it was kind of funny, you know. They started at five and six. Uh, you know, people have different, you know, even just right directly in this area, five and six and seven. They're playing and they're playing tackle football already. Um, some people think it's a it's a great idea to to teach them that young. Uh, some people even like across the river, they'll play flag football at a young age and then uh, gradually teach them how to tackle. Um, personally, I think that's probably a little bit better way to do it. Uh, having it a little bit older. Uh, these guys, you know, we want the kids to love the sport and come out and and be safe. And you know, our guys, we, we you know, my my thoughts, I should say, are are more along the lines of keeping them interested, make sure they want to come back the next year. Uh, I know when our coach at the youth youth leagues and different sports, um, goal was not always to win. Goal was to make sure they learned something make sure they had a good time, and make sure they want to come back next year. As they get older and they get those competitive juices that we talked about before when they get them flowing, uh, then it's time to start teaching them the, the sport the way the way it's played. This was Coach Matt Polanis here on Education, Leadership, and Beyond. Matt, I, I wish you the best uh, this Saturday and uh, on a busy week. I really appreciate you making some time to come on the program. You did a great job. You got it. Thanks, Andrew. I appreciate it. We'll Go. see you guys all on Saturday. And we, uh, we'll have the, the furniture ready. Before we sign off, uh, I do. next week's guest is the chief of police here in Port Jervis. Chief Bill Warden is going to be next week's guest on our program. And we have our quote. And uh, I hope our team is going to do great this weekend. But the quote is, it's not the best team that always wins. It's the team that plays the best together. We'll say that again for our friends listening at home. Evel, I know you got your pen. It is not the best team that always wins. It's the team that plays best together. That is all. This was show 18.